Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Training with This Dot Labs. Today, we are going to be talking about advanced Nuxt and all sorts of cool things uh, with Nuxt. We're going to be doing that with Daniel Rowe, who's the framework lead at Nuxt. Daniel, uh, without further ado, I guess, let's let's get rolling. Unfortunately, for those of you that are watching, uh, you're not going to be able to ask questions live, but if you do have questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments, and we'll be sure to circle back around and try to get an answer for you. But for those of you that are in the room here with us today, uh, please make sure to ask questions. Uh, that's a big part of uh, of learning and then of what we're hoping to do today. So Daniel, feel free, get us started. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to diving in. Um, I'll share my screen just because it seems like quite a lot of what probably <laughs> probably will end up doing will be be on on screen. Um, and I'll start off just by saying like how we would get going with a, a fresh Nuxt project, and we'll just see where we go. So um, Nuxt, if you're not familiar with it, is a framework for building full stack uh, web apps. Uh, it's built on Vue for the front end framework. Uh, it uses Vite as a bundler, uh, and it uses Nitro as a server framework. Uh, Nitro was actually built as part of making Nuxt, but it's now available for lots of different frameworks to use. And there's already a, an Angular meta framework called Analog, uh, and Solid Start uh, uses that as well. Um, so to get started with Nuxt, uh, I'm aware this might not be the advanced bit of the thing. Um, we, you basically run this uh, Nuxy command. Now, Nuxy is a RCLI, um, and it exists separately from Nuxt itself. So if you want to have a look uh, at that and some of the plans for it, you can go to Nuxt CLI on GitHub um, and you can see some of what it, it offers. So uh, we have some commands, for example, um, there's some documentation in the Nuxt docs as well, but it, it can do quite a lot of different things. And we also have in mind for it to be uh, configurable <clears throat> in terms of extensible as in, so you can create your own sub commands for it. But right now, let's just get going by typing uh, Nuxy. Uh, in it, uh, and you probably want to add that at latest whenever you're using NPX, just not just Nuxy, because N NPX aggressively caches um, executables, and you might find that you're running something from a year ago, uh, or whenever it was you first ran NPX something. So uh, very, very, very well worth um, uh, adding that at latest bit at the end. Um, OK, so let's create a new project, um, and we'll, we'll call it uh, Nuxt App, because I have no imagination. Um, and out of the box, you'll be able to, to pick um, the package manager you want to use. I'm going to pick bun just because it's fun. Oh, uh, we the bun route. OK. So well, bun is a package manager. Um, it's, it's, it's nice. Uh, and I'll initialize the Git repository as well. And we will just open up that directory in VS Code. Um, so out of the box, um, you have a, we have a quite a minimal um, starter uh, template. Um, and uh, it comes with. Uh, TS config, um, which extends something which Nux generates for you. Um, and that has lots of information on all of the different TypeScript bits of, uh, of your app. So it uh, tell, tells um, your IDE about certain imports that you can make from, from some aliases. Um, it includes um, any modules or other, other code you might be using in your TypeScript environment and excludes certain things as well. Um, so hopefully that, that gets you uh, all up and going uh, in terms of your IDE and uh, type safety. For example, define next config isn't imported anywhere, but it has types. Uh, and you will you should find that to be true throughout your, your app. For example, Nuxt welcome is a component that Nuxt makes available, and uh, your IDE should know that that exists. Um, if for whatever reason you find that's not the case, check that you have the uh, view language features Volar extension installed. Uh, that is the de facto standard for Vue. Um, and there's some more information in the Nux docs as well if you want to, to check it out in terms of getting up and going with uh, with TypeScript. Um, there's yeah some, some stuff here in terms of what you might want to do. Uh, TypeScript particularly is well worth uh, having a look at. Um, OK, so once, you, once you're up and going, you might want to run, in this case, we'll run the dev server. So bun run dev. Uh, and the uh, if if by the way you want to run natively with bun, uh, you would do bun bun run dev, uh, and that will open this uh, not in Node but in the bun runtime, which Nux supports as well. 
Um, so, yeah, try that out if you want. But it, Bun is is in in development. Um, so do expect that there might be occasional um, uh, points of friction. But the Bun team are fantastically fast at fixing those, though. So just report them, and uh, and and proceed. Uh, but yes, you feel free to try Bun on the uh, uh, on its own runtime, uh, and it it is it is very fast. So that's quite quite nice. When you get going with Nux, you'll find that we have got uh, a little welcome screen. Yeah. Uh, I am also going to uh, make sure uh, to show you the dev tools. So um, out of the box, we have this uh, option in your Nux config, which lets you see see the dev tools. Um, and you can open them by opening a little uh, button at the bottom of the screen. This uh, Nux logo it has a little uh, counter to tell you how long um, the app took to load and to help help you keep focused on performance as you build. Uh, and then there's a little component inspector as well. So if you tap the component inspector, you can select anything on the page uh, and actually and click it and it will uh, open that then for you in your IDE. Um, it does rely on your IDE configuration. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure if it, it's working with my screen sharing, but you, you'll find that works locally for you. Uh, and if you open the DevTools, there's a whole um, there's a whole um, dev tools here available for you. Um, so it has tells you some information about your project. Um, the first time you open it, this is actually inherited some some settings from the last time I opened it. And the first time you open it, um, it'll prompt you to um, to click a get started button, uh, and uh, and it will then take you to this, this screen. Um, there are a number of things uh, panels in the dev tools which are well worth exploring. It also supports command K. Uh, and you can search through the, the different panels and actually access um, any different um, panel that is, is available to you. Uh, and so these are the ones that are available out of the box, uh, stuff like you could access an open graph tag and see what this is going to look like uh, in search engines if um, or in, in, in Facebook or Twitter or Telegram. Um, and it will prompt you to add the things that you might have missed. Um, I can show you how to do that in a moment. Uh, it'll show you all the pages in your app. In this case, we don't have any yet because we haven't created this pages index.view file. And if we want to do that, we can actually interact with our app um, through the DevTools. So in this case, I can click uh, Enable Routing. And I very much hope in the past, I have actually experienced an issue with, uh, with fun installing apps. But in this case, we have we've created our index.view file. Um, and if I reload that page, Nux routing has been set up correctly. Um, and now the dev tools are showing me information about the roots of the app. So I have, in this case, just one file. Uh, and then I have some middleware that are registered in the app. Um, and it, as you build your app out or it becomes bigger, this becomes more and more useful. So I might, for example, go and create another file about. Uh, I'll just give it some content. Uh, and if I go back into my um, my DevTools, the next time I have a look, you can see that we have that about, that about path. And I can actually easily navigate backwards and forwards between those routes just in the DevTools um, and actually see, um, well, anyway, there's a lot of stuff that you'll be able to see in here. Uh, components, um, you can see some of the components that are available to you in your app. So this is built in by Next. Uh, and you can see whether they're used or not, none of them are are used on this page, which is why they're all grayed out. But you would be able to find out more information about them. Um, and so in some cases, when you add a, a module, the components will show up here, as well as some documentation. Uh, imports, there's a lot of imports um, that Next makes available to you that are auto-imported. So for example, if we were going to edit our, our index.file, uh, our index.view um, here, we might, or our about.view, we might want to use some of views uh, reactivity so I might want to do something like uh, title is ref. Um, hey there. Hmm, I'm just going to reload my window. And uh, that ref is auto imported from, from view. Um, and you actually get the, the type um, type there. Uh, and you'll get type safety in the, uh, in the template as well, powered by that Vola, um, uh, the Vola. Uh, extension I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so for example, if we were here now not on the uh, 
this page, but on the about page switch, we see the text in the page. And if we had a look at the imports, uh, we would actually see that ref uh, is being used on this page. Actually, we're not seeing it in the dev tools, but it is, it's used on the page. This is one of my favorite tabs, the install new module bit here. So uh, one that you might be interested in, for example, uh, you can have a look at the different modules that are available to you within Nuxt. These are also available on nux.com uh, modules. Uh, so here are, here are some, it's the same data set and you can search through it. Um, and it's all based on uh, this Git repo here, the Nuxt modules repo. So you can submit a PR to add your own module. Um, and typically I'll then, uh, or one of the other team will take a look at it and we'll do provide some advice. But, uh, but you'd be very welcome to do that if you've got something. Question from, um, uh, question from the group. Uh, they were curious uh, how to configure the dev tools, if that's a possibility. Like, for example, if they wanted to have IntelliJ open up instead of Visual Studio Code when doing shortcuts or things like that. That's a good question. Um, so let me have a look. I think it should work, whatever your default uh, editor is. Uh, but let me have a very quick check. So. The, the thing, so that opens up my VS code there for me uh, into that, that particular file, which is where this is. Um, the way that it works, I should probably, I, I need, to, need to just confirm that. So this is the next DevTools repo. And uh, let's see whether it's a VS code specific thing. We've got a, there is, by the way, uh, you can actually run VS code within your DevTools which is probably not what you're interested in, but that is, it is totally possible. Uh, the, the, so basically what happens when you open um, the, the, the way that we know what file to open is that in the DOM, when we render every bit of the code, we have this data V inspector, which tells you the, the file and the line in the file. Uh, and that means that fully on the client side, we can uh, support this click to open type thing. So um, this click to go to the file is what is powering it. Now, I think that is actually not coming from the DevTools repo, but I think it is a separate, uh, this Vite view, view inspector, Let's see. It is this, um, and let's see if it works with other other things than VS Code. I, I'm sure I'm sure it does, but I just just want to confirm that for you. It is. Okay. Yep. So basically, we support. Atom, Sublime, Visual Studio Code, App Code, Codium, whatever. Um, and the, let's see, how do we do that? Okay, we guess the editor here by checking whether mm. any of those are open in the background. So if I'm oh, running that. Oh, nice. Okay. CSX. So, and then that is what's going to return back the, um, the process that we then execute to open it up. So it works. Okay. I'm sorry if that's the two. No, that's, two that was no, that was really cool to see. I, and then there was one other question. We can table it if you'd like and come back to it. But they were curious about like the performance issues. Obviously, I think down at the bottom, it showed like the app load time as one of the metrics. But they were just kind of curious how deep some of the performance tracing uh, capabilities might go and what they might be able to see through that, that dev tools piece. Like would, would it show waterfalls or things of that nature? Or is that not really something that could, that's that, as feasible in this version? So one of the challenges it, it, when, um, when tracking performance is obviously performance in development mode is going to be hugely different than in, uh, in production, which is the, uh, which basically, which is a shame because typically you have this great flow when you're building that you, you change something, you see the result, and you can immediately pivot. But often performance isn't like that. You have to build your app, you run it, then you can run your tests, and then you have to then circle back, make changes in your code. And so it, it can become very tricky. Um, this, uh, so, so 
the load, load time always in development is going to be much larger. You'll see your network um, downloads are going to be, it's going to be lots more of them. This is, that's not even all of them. That's just like lots and lots of things. That's just how Veet works. So every different possible, and that is going to be a killer on performance. If you, if you were to, I don't know, do a lighthouse test on your dev server, it would be awful. Um, so j just to say that is, um, that is uh, the, uh, a caveat. Um, having said that, you can obviously check the load time. And we also have an experimental feature, which actually lets you trace the, um, so it's this timeline feature here, um, which allows you to trace the execution time of different um, composables within your app. Now, this isn't the same thing as a waterfall chart, so we don't provide exactly that, but uh, I'll show you what it does. Um, so in order to enable it, we actually have to change our Nux config because it's an experimental feature we don't want to enable by default, and then actually injects code into your development time app. Um, and so uh, we, we can do that again from the dev tools. So we'll make this change. Uh, and actually in the background, it's going to change our Nux config. So it's, that is it's so cool. added this, this line to it. Um, so now we have, um, I might need to refresh the page, I guess. Uh, so now we have the start tracking thing. Um, I'm going to have to create something so that we actually um, can take advantage of it. So let's try, uh, okay, I'll add a button. And we're going to navigate to, th this is not what I would do. Don't, don't do this with a button, do this with a link. Um, but I, I just wanted to show you how it's going to track something, um, do something trackable. Okay. So. Uh, is my syntax correct? There we go. Okay, so I'm going to start tracking. I think start tracking. Oh, it was the, uh, okay. So on in, in the left, you can see that there have already been some things called. So use route has been called, use state. I'm going to do something else. Uh, and hopefully, yeah, there it is coming in. So I've got these different um, executions of different different things. Um, showing up in this, this state. You can also view this differently. You can view it in a list, which is what I tend to prefer. But what you can actually see is um, every one of these function calls um, that's been called, uh, everyone that's available through the next auto imports, that is, um, is made available to us. So we can get a little trace of when, where it was called, uh, when it happened, how long it took. Um, so all of that can be quite useful. Um, you can also check, um, uh, other things. So for example, your plugins, uh, these are the different, um, so it, when you start Nuxt, the very first thing that it does before uh, hydrating the page on the client side and before starting to render it on the server is that it runs plugins. So you can create a plugin to do something you need to do on a global level. But because they block, they intentionally block um, the app, um, you should be very careful not to do too much in them. And so uh, if you want to take a look and see the timing of your plugins, you can do that this way. So we can see where what's taking time and what you might need to optimize if you had a plugin that took a long time. So for example, you might uh, create a plugin here. You create a next plugin by creating a file and saving it in plugin the plugins directory. So um, my plugin. And, uh, oh, for goodness sake. There we go. Uh, and so that plugin uh, could do something. So we could uh, await uh, we promise resolve. Okay, so that's a make it async. Uh, and that is going to take a second. So if I now reload the page, um, what we should see is that we've got this red one second timing next to that plugin, which is going to tell us that is a problem. Take a look at it. So that's one thing you can take a look at. Um, there are also, um, Nuxt has a number of different things. Uh, I'll have to disable that so it doesn't keep slowing the app down. Um, there are also um, uh, hooks in the Nuxt, uh, the Nuxt app, uh, which are, uh, some of those are build time hooks um, and uh, are running through the Nuxt builds lifecycle. They won't happen in your app at runtime, but they will be happening while you develop. Uh, and then there are other um, hooks which are sort of, which are runtime hooks. 
Um, so in this case, all of these hooks down here are build time hooks. So um, you could diagnose why your, your server might be slow, for example. Um, if, if it was taking a long time to start up, that might be useful if you're developing Next itself or developing a module. Um, these hooks at the top, they're your app hooks. Uh, and so you can see what's happening at different stages. Um, and again, this is pretty much out of the box. We're not expecting anything unusual here, but that's another area you might be able to dive into if you're wanting to, to look at some performance issues. Um, so that, yeah, that could be quite useful. Um, let's, there are a few, few other kinds of things you could have a look at. You could look at your assets, the things that are in your, your uh, public directory. Um, you can look at your app configuration or your public runtime configuration. Um, these are uh, different features that Next exposes to allow you to, to make your app configurable. So um, in this case, we would be able to, I'm just going to move that over there. Uh, and let's move this over here. There we go. We can see them side by side. So if I wanted to create a, um, an app config.ts file, uh, I can create some configuration for my app that I, that I might want to uh, access at in, in my components or composables. And I would do something like this, I don't know, theme uh, doc. Uh, and then in my app, I would be able to show that like this. And that's going to show up for me. What have I done? I should be seeing that in here. We also have runtime config. I'm going to check that in a second. We have runtime config. Uh, and runtime config is um, where you're going to put anything that you want to be changeable at runtime, as the name suggests. Um, it has a particular syntax and works in a particular kind of way. So we have got here uh, our app config uh, and our runtime config there as well. Um, now, in our uh, Nuxt configuration file, we have to specify whatever we want to be overridable at runtime. So um, if you have, for example, a secret key or token, um, you, can, you can put it here. It will only be available on the server. So it won't be passed to the client side, although just make sure you don't render it in HTML because there's nothing we can do to stop that. Uh, but you might do something like, I don't know, GitHub token. Um, you can set that out there just as a, an empty string. Um, and actually, Next will tell you the special environment variable name that you need to set if you want to override that at runtime. So in this case, it's just Next underscore and then a, a screaming uh, a screaming snake case, uh, a screaming snake case uh, variable, in this case, Next GitHub token. Um, so I could then actually just set that by creating uh, .env file and say, uh, what was it? Next GitHub token is this. Uh, and so, so that would then be usable in my app. I'm just going to log console log it. Um, uh, we'll actually get type safety there with it. So it's uh, github.token. Um, and if that were to change uh, or become a I don't know, a different kind of thing. I might get uh, that. Um, uh, I'm, I might get some some warnings about that in my build time process. I'm going to disable the on flag here, just run it normally. Uh, and you'll see we've just console logged it and it's being it's logging to the console as we expect. Uh, you'll see it's crashing at runtime because it's not available in on the client. So obviously we'd need to handle that. It's not going to be uh, available uh, in the browser. Um, if you do need to pass something to the browser, um, you might have some runtime configuration that's not secret or sensitive. You can wrap that in a public object. 
So the public object gets uh, passed to the client. So we could say something like a public key is uh, hey. Uh, and that is going to be available. In fact, we might just stick it in directly in there. The text in there. Oh, actually, it should, should be showing up here, public key. Uh, hey, uh, you see, you see, there's a flash. For goodness sake, stop, stop arc. I don't want this to go away. See, there's a bit of a flash when I refresh the page, and um, and what's happening there is that the server is rendering the entire contents of your runtime config, including the stuff that doesn't exist on the client. Uh, and then when we load the client, it 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 gets rid of it again. Um, you should always that's a technically a hydration error. Uh, and if we had a look in our console, it would probably complain um, and say that, that, that there's a mismatch uh, because what's being rendered on the server is not the same as what's being rendered on the client. So you always need to make sure in any server rendered app that you're not using something that's unique to the, the server um, to render some state on your screen because that is not going to work on, in both the browser and the server environments. In this case, we would just make sure not to log the runtime config, but maybe just the runtime config public. That's going to exist in both places. And so we, now we get a nice stable um, app. But you can also see that we have got this, um, this app config here um, showing up in our dev tools. Oh, and our theme is showing up. I think it was when I restarted it without the bun flag. Uh, and that's showing up there. There's some other stuff uh, you could have a look at as well. Um, but uh, yeah, we can do that as we go. But for now, let's install a module. So um, you might want, for example, to add Tailwind CSS. That's a common thing. It, again, is going to make some changes to our uh, Nuxt configuration. It's going to add a module and actually install it by adding it to our dependencies. And you can see that's happening in the foreground here. It's restarting the app for us. And um, you see the styling has changed because Tailwind is now configured. Uh, I mentioned, I may have mentioned, that uh, different modules can add their own DevTools panels. And you see there's this new icon here, Tailwind CSS. Um, and you can actually uh, have a look. We refresh that. Huh. You can have a look at that page. And hopefully see the Tailwind configure DevTools, um, which has all of our Tailwind configuration here. Um, in this case, you might make this a little bit bigger. And you can see font sizes, font families, and so on um, for a nice interactive thing. Um, but there, there's other stuff too. So if you, for example, had uh, the view use as a library, people often will install. Um, and it is um, it has lots and lots and lots of uh, configurable functions, like using local storage or interacting with um, all kinds of different things. You see, like it's got it can thousand stars on, on GitHub. Um, and it has its own uh, dev tools as well. So you could have a look at the documentation here um, and have a look at some of the these uh, different composables that it makes available. Uh, and these, if you're using that module, they're all automatically um, enabled uh, in the app. So um, you can see that they're, they're, they're all listed here. Um, and you can actually have a little look at the, the documentation for them just by clicking and then opening the docs directly like that. Uh, quite a handy little tool to be able to do something like that. Um, and so, um, yeah, I would highly recommend just uh, exploring, having a look at some of the different things that you can do, you can even see who's responsible for each module and ping them directly if needed. Um, responsibly, uh, so responsibly. Responsibly, exactly. <laughs> ping them with appreciation, say thank you. That's uh, That's the nice thing. So, um, so yes, there's lots and lots of stuff here. And the DevTools does have some settings of its own. You can turn off different uh, features of it, uh, decide that you don't want to see certain panels. Um, you can reset your settings. Uh, you can opt out. So I've opted in already on my machine. When you start, you'll get a chance to opt into telemetry or not. It's not scary. It's just we want to know if people are using it and what bits of it they're using. Uh, and you can pick lots and lots of other things as well. So we can make it small, um, change the theme. Tell me that's not a nice animation. And uh, show lots and lots of other things uh, as well. So lots of stuff there um, to explore. Um, one of the things 
that uh, you might find when you get up. Uh, oh, one of one thing you might want to know about DevTools is um, where it like where where it works, and it only works. So right now, it's, this is only working locally because it's actually part of your project. Part of how it knows all of this stuff is that it's not running in your browser. It's actually running in your app. Um, so it, it's part of the rendered HTML when you when you get it back. So if, if, if you just take a look at the app, yeah, um, you'll actually see that we have got stuff like, here's the, the, the time metric. Um, so that's, that's going to help tell us how long it takes to load. Um, you'll see that we also have a script that it injects. Um, so we've got um, like this. This is the Vite plugin inspector that helps us click directly into the the, the code, um, and uh, and so basically DevTools is part of part of your app. Now we we have been been thinking and exploring about how to make it usable in production if you need to do some deep diving, um, but right now that's not yet available. So uh, it 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 might be possible to do something a, a little bit lighter. To have a subset of features um, that that works on a an app that has been built. If you do ever need to debug an app that is already in production, there are a few things that might be useful to you, um, and I'll show you them. So, uh, one is in I'll just build this app, and start it locally. So, okay, our app is built, and we've just started it in production. Um, and it should behave in exactly the same way. Um, now, in your in your console, we have access to use Nux app. That's actually going to give you access to your, your global Nux um, um, object in the same way as if you were in a Nux plugin or something like that. Uh, and you can actually do all kinds of things with it. So you could see what the path is. Uh, you could access the payload and see the data. Um, now, this is... Uh, always accessible to you anyway through a debugger. So you can always get this data. So this, just to be clear, this is there's nothing uh, secret about what's being revealed here. But it is a very, very convenient thing if you need to debug your app in production. You can, def you can definitely make use of that. Um, another thing that I often uh, do, um, if, you're, if you're needing to sort of figure out what, what, why something is doing something, um, there are a couple of settings you might want to enable in your Nux config. So one is you can turn on debug mode. Uh, and this will do things like um, you'll, it will log every extra thing that uh, you might want to see. So it will log every hook that Nux runs and tell you how long it takes to run it. These are all build time hooks. Um, and if you're wanting to debug a performance issue, that's something somewhere to start. And it will also do the same for your runtime app. So if we, we run build the app in debug mode uh, and start it again. Um, this time, we'll actually get some logs in the console that tell us every hook that runs in our Nuxt app and how long it takes. Um, those are effectively the different, the Nuxt like life cycle um, aspects of, of the app. Um, you can also do a couple of other things. So you can enable source maps, um, which you might want to, um, you might not want to do. They take a little bit of extra time and memory when you're building. Uh, but if you're needing to do some debugging, that's helpful. Um, and you might also uh, turn off minification if you're actually wanting to, to debug something in production. So we'd say minify false or vite, and we do the same for nitro. So we could just say again uh, minify false, uh, and that way you're going to get like full um, function names and, and details if you ever wanted to dig into something um, at, at at runtime. Uh, and of course, you probably don't want to de deploy non-minified code to production, but you might use this uh, locally when you're building. Uh, if you want to do something like that, um, there is another way to configure your Nuxt app other than just uh, the Nuxt configuration. Uh, it's the more advanced uh, use case, but you can create a .nuxtrc file either uh, in a project or in your home directory on your computer. Uh, and any configuration here will override a configuration of any Nuxt app that you're um, looking at. So for example, um, you could create a global module um, that it runs in every Nuxt project that you use. Uh, you might have your own special configuration that you want to, to apply, and you can do that. I would highly recommend not doing that in your home directory um, for features that will make a difference to the app. 
um, because you'll, you might be confused as to why your tests are doing something a little bit different. But you might find that, that there are things you want to do uh, and you want to do globally. And that is something you can, you can certainly do. I often create a global module for my app that does things like response to uh, command line flags. So when I'm starting my app, I, I doesn't matter which app it is on my machine or which reproduction I'm using, um, I can access sort of useful debugging tools myself. Um, so if you're wanting to do something like that, uh, the way you you um, use a .nuxt.rc is you would take this the same config that we've just put in our Nuxt app, uh, and we just turn it into a sort of dot syntax. So we say debug, true, source map, true, uh, vite, build, vite, stop it, build, minify, false, nitro, minify, false. And that that will do it for us. That will set the same configuration. Uh, and then when I start my app, that will uh, automatically configure it for us. I don't know why VS Code is complaining about this. Next RC is not a TypeScript file. But, uh, oh, it, it's because I initially pasted TypeScript into it. And so it's it's it thinks it might be TypeScript. Uh, another thing you might want to, to try, um, and actually this would have totally avoided the Next RC um, miss highlighting for us. Uh, try uh, installing Nuxta. It's it's a community developed extension, um, and it comes with a number of useful things like syntax highlighting in your .nuxt.rc file, um, and also uh, useful uh, configuration. So we could do let's see, we could access some of the, the 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 options in a type safe way in your .nuxt.rc, but it also comes with lots and lots of other handy tools. Um, so you can easily create plugins, middleware, and, and things like that. Um, install modules. It's effectively it's something like Next Step Tools, but for your IDE. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Right. So um, if we were to dive back into um, the development mode of the app, unless people also have uh, any other questions. Uh, oh, you see, it's still respecting that, that debug mode, uh, all because of that Next IC file. So I think we might just disable those options. And next restarts for us, but without debug. Uh, let me show you around the next directory and some of the things that you might do there. So um, in a plugin, you can set up some global state. Um, now, I mentioned that this blocks your app. Uh, and so for that reason, we expose an on next ready callback function. This is always safe to call because if Nuxt is already ready and your app is interactive, it will run the function immediately, uh, I think in a request animation frame. Uh, but if your app isn't yet ready, so for example, if it's still hydrating, it will defer whatever you run until it's ready. So this is a great place to put some initialization of a tracking script or something like that. You don't want to be blocking user interaction. You'll see it on your core web vitals. Um, and it's a bad experience for you users. So stick it in an on next ready function. That's quite a helpful place to do it. Um, so you can use plugins to perform that initial setup, but actually still defer any expensive operations until your app is ready to go. Um, you might also find that there's something that you want to run, um, but and only run once in your app, uh, but you don't want to create a plugin for it. Uh, this is increasingly common with U3 which uh, helps us think a lot more in terms of composables. So rather than monolithically setting everything up at the beginning of our app and then consuming it, you might actually want to set it up somewhere else. So uh, for this, we have a, a once function, uh, which will basically ensure that something only runs once, no matter how many times it's invoked. So if I created a composable, something like um, export function use user, uh, and actually, the first time that this runs, I want to, I don't know, perform a network call or something like that, uh, or just log something in the console in this case. I actually have access to uh, once, oh, what is it? I've even forgotten. On once, on once, only once, for goodness sake. Let's open this in the dev tools and see what it is. Where is my left tools not there? Okay. 
Shift Option D. Headed. Okay, let's open up call once. Thank you very much. We will go call once and we will basically uh let's see. Console log. Hey there. And we'll run this use user function a couple of times. Not that you would ever do this quite like this, but you might find that um, you initialize something when you first load a page, then you navigate away, and then you come back to the page again, and you don't need to reinitialize it. Um, well, I'll use the pages just to make sure that I can uh, navigate to and come back. Pages. Not the which I did it in index. And it's literally displaying on the page. Oh, it's what's it logging? Oh, I see. I must have it, it must be all ah, I'll tell you why. Um it is running once, but it is running on this in the server, uh, in this particular um uh, in this particular situation. So what we probably want to do uh, in this case uh, is, is actually only run it on the client. Um, and we can do that in that, through a number of uh, useful uh, utilities that enable tree shaking um, available off of import meta. So we can do something like if import meta.server, then we're just gonna return. So we're only going to run this on the client. And so you also can access import meta.client uh, uh, browser, uh, you can access pre-render, that will be a bit true in, when you're pre-rendering your app. Um, server test will be true in a test environment. Uh, and those are tree shakeable. So if you, it, when we do this and we compile our server, this code just simply won't make it in at all. Um, so in this case, I'd just be able to open up the uh, app again, and you'll see it's logging hey there and only once uh, because it's only being run once as we would expect. Um, now, if you are setting up global state, um, you can also do something like uh, return or provide an object to the rest of your app um, that you have set up. So you could still use that monolithic approach. Uh, and so you might have, for example, a user uh, and it has a logged in value, which in this case is false. Uh, now that would then be accessible. So in our about page, we could do use next app and access the user we've just created. Uh, and actually we can access in a type safe way all the properties of that user. Um, if you're wanting to do that and preserve reactivity, then you'll almost certainly want to wrap it in a reactive um, so that it will track the changes. And so if you changed it in one place, it would update in another place. So you might get something like this and this would be a common, a common pattern. Okay, um, but use plugins with care. They are powerful, but you don't want to block the um, initialization of your app. Um, composables, you'll have noticed, um, if you create a file in that directory and it exports something, that file will become available as your composable um, everywhere in your app. So you will be able to do something like uh, check your composables. Uh, where are they, composables? Imports. Uh, and you'll see that we have this uh, user which exports use user. Uh, and we can see it's being used seven times. Seven times for some reason. Why is it being used seven times? Well, it's being used seven times uh, in this particular render cycle. Uh, and that is uh, a useful way to explore some of the stuff that you're using. Sometimes it's hard to bridge the gap between business objectives and tech implementation, and it can get messy. This dot is trusted by top names like Meta, Google, and T-Mobile, and they love helping business leaders fulfill their strategic digital initiatives. Check them out at thisdot.co. One more time, that's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Uh, the same is true for any components that you create in your components directory. Uh, so you could create a, um, you could easily create, say, a layout component. Uh, say the footer. 
And we'll just say, here is a footer. We might then use that in our app at the bottom of the page. Um, our IDE will be aware that it exists and will also be aware of any props that it has. So for example, if we wanted to give some uh, props to this footer, and we're going to say we're going to want the footer to take an array of links, maybe. Uh, and that would be, um, maybe we're going to use the, the, the um, TypeScript syntax here of the defined props, and we'll say links are going to be an array of strings. Um, we'll actually get the type safety in uh, in our app.view, uh, and we would only be able to pass that kind of thing. So we should, wouldn't be able to pass things 42. Sometimes my ID lags behind a little bit, but that should be a, uh, showing a type error for us. Um, so it's expecting it to be a string, array of strings, uh, and that is what it um, needs to be in this particular case. There we go. So we would get a build error if that was wrong. And our footer is, is displaying what again automatically. So we don't have to import that. It's just available to us and we get type um, type errors if it's if it's not used correctly. Okay. Um, so if we are, let's see, where are we here? We have our uh, pages, components, composables, uh, plugins. Uh, with, if you're using the next uh, pages directory, which is the view router integration, um, it's worth saying, by the way, that if you don't use it, um, then view router won't be included in your app. So if you don't have a pages directory, if you have a really simple app that doesn't need it, um, then uh, you you won't have the, the extra bundle size. And that's in general a pattern we've, we've adopted for Nuxt. So page speed.dev, for example, which is a, um, an app I launched recently, doesn't have, doesn't use view router because it's, too simple really to benefit from it. View router is great, but if you have an app that doesn't need it, then you can easily do something like this, which just is displaying some information on a page and doesn't need to have um, a routing engine. Um, so that's worth, worth knowing. Uh, but if you are using it, there are a lot of things that there's, uh, there, there's some quite powerful stuff you can do. So for example, if we had a middleware directory, we can define root guards that might apply to our entire app or even only just to specific pages. So we might have uh, something like uh, auth. Uh, and in this case, we could create a middleware file and we could actually, let's just say, we're going to return um, use next app, uh, what did I, user logged in. Okay, so, uh, this is going to, and I, I, I can make this a little bit more semantic. So if I say, if um, if we're not logged in, then we're going to return abort navigation. Okay, so we're going to prevent the user from accessing that page. Uh, and say now we go to about, and we, we are going to protect this route. We're going to use that define page meta. This is how, this is a compiler macro, um, which lets us set things on root, on the root uh, of the, the, um, that this page represents. So it basically gets extracted out of the component. Uh, and so we can use that to, to do things like uh, define middleware that will run before the page ever gets loaded or imported. So in this case, we could say we're going to have middleware and we want to add the auth middleware. Again, we get type safety on that. Um, so that should mean if I open up my say, index page, uh, actually, I'll open up my app.view and I'm just going to add some links. So stick another rule and we'll have a, uh, a link to the homepage and we'll have another link to the about page. And this, this um, protected, that's not going to work, right? Because we're not logged in. So if I try clicking that link, it's just not going to, to load the page for me. That's the middleware working in that particular case. Um, we can also um, have a, uh, we can also create global middleware, which will always run. Uh, so you might want to, for example, let's call this one um, something but global. Uh, this is always going to run before every root navigation. And so 
Like if we left that unchanged, it would stop us from going to any page. So in this particular case, we would want to do something like uh, we might want to um, dispatch uh, dispatch an event um, to track the navigation to that page. It might be something you might want to do, um, or you might want to have some custom logic. Uh, and so you could do something like this. In this case, I'll just console log uh, changing to that path. Uh, and actually, I think it's probably not going to work because we only have two routes. I need to create another one. Let's create a contact. And we'll create a link to it. Again, this is just so, so you can see what's what's going on when we click the So um, if I open the uh, DevTools, refresh the page, and click Contact, um, we're logging that route transition, which is something you might expect. So that's, that's what would work there. Um, one thing that you might try, and I would highly recommend if you're using, um, if you're using Nuxt, uh, is to enable the experimental typed pages option. Um, this will, it's, it, operates purely at the type level. So it's not going to change the runtime behavior of your code, but it gives type safety to your roots. So for example, um, in, in a Nuxt app, uh, we have, in this case, it has in, index, contact, and about. But you could put a link in there to anything. And normally things aren't, aren't typed. But here, we now have the ability to do something like this, Nuxt link to, and we actually have access, I, apart from the, the, the um, directories which VS Code is sticking in, TypeScript is telling me that my possible routes are slash, about, or contact. That is a pretty useful thing. So um, it's going to give me type safety there. And if I want to use the object syntax to access something, which is um, another way that view router supports um, routing, I'm going to get access, type safe access to things like the name of the route. So um, that's also quite a useful thing to be able to do. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, and it becomes even more relevant when you have routes with dynamic um, slugs, dynamic parameters in them. So you might have something like log slug.ts. That's going to render um, forward slash blog, forward slash then anything in a slug as long as it doesn't have another slash. If you wanted that, you would add a three dots, and then it will capture every uh, every different uh, parameter along the way. Um, and you can also do things like have, uh, um, have more dynamic syntax. So you could have something like user-slug.ts, and it's going to create route matcher and pick up those different aspects of the, of the blog. So we could try that and create a little uh, component. Oops. We name it .view and create a little component. And we're just going to show here at root dot params. Oh, const root is use root with um, the typed roots option, the typed pages option, you actually need to pass the path to use root so it knows where you are in the app. Um, so it can then provide the correct types for the root that comes back. Uh, so I'm going to reload the window again and pass into this root. Uh, where is it? Come on. log user slug. There we go. What have I done wrong here? I have removed the ending tag of the script. OK. So um, now I actually get type safe access to this, this root object. And if I type root dot params, it's going to have slug and user, but nothing else. So the only thing that is unsafe is that I have to make sure to, to tell it where we are in the, in the app. But after that point, I then get very, very nice access to um, the particular params that will be available to me on this page. Uh, and the same will be true if I'm navigating to it. 
So if I want to say I want to go to a blog user slug, um, it's going to uh, complain if, for example, I pass the wrong set of params here. So I need to have a user and a slug in order to navigate to that route. And if I don't, it will it will say that, that I've done something wrong. So in this case, I'll say uh, user Daniel and slug is intro. Uh, and now I'm going to have a little uh, object syntax link, a little object syntax link. And if I hover over that, you'll see that it's rendered that into a nice little um, URL, forward slash blog, forward slash Daniel dash intro, which uses that uh, complex pattern um, that I created using the file system routing of Nuxt. So um, again, quite a useful thing to enable. Um, there are uh, quite a lot of other things in the view side of the app, but I would be remiss if I didn't touch on the server directory. So the server directory of your Nuxt app um, is powered by Nitro, which is the server rendering framework that's built for, for, for serverless environment, the edge. Um, it's very, very fast. Um, and it works um, in lots of different places, including Cloudflare workers, do you know, um, and even runtimes that don't fully aren't fully being used yet, like Winter CG and and others. We're even experimenting with Amazon's new LLRT uh, runtime, uh, and it follows similar kinds of patterns. So, for example, you can create API routes in there. Uh, you could try something like uh, API foo, and that is going to return. Uh, you can directly return JSON, for example. Uh, and hit that. We'll spot that it's an object, uh, set the content type, stringify it, do everything that you might want to do to get the right kind of response. Uh, if you're then using that in your app, uh, you could do something like this. Uh, you use We use this uh, dollar sign fetch uh, utility. It's based on a, a, another library called ofetch which will do things like automatically pass responses if they're JSON to remove that um, extra bit of pain. Um, you get type safe um, root access, so that, that's your API root and it's available to you. Um, you also get type safe um, data, like the return type of that particular fetch request because it's internal uh, to your app, so we know that that is the case. So, uh, that data will then uh, would then be available in your app, and you could, could use it if you wanted to. Uh, it doesn't have to be an API route. Uh, you can also just create a route uh, which might have another prefix. So we might say uh, rss.xml.get.ts. Uh, this uh, is going to be called rss.xml, but it will only be accessible on a get request. That's what the dot .get adds there for me. And then I would be able to do something like add, I don't know, I could add an, an RSS feed or something like that. Uh, and then if we hit that endpoint, um, we're actually just going to directly get whatever I've put there. And in that case, I put text.html. That's when it's inferred from the fact that it's a string. But we could also do set header uh, event content type and give it a more accurate header. And that would then start coming through here. There are lots and lots of these um, these uh, composable utilities for interacting both on the server side with your event and also on the client side. Um, and because they're auto-imported, they can be tree shaken out if you don't use them. So you can have a very, very minimal um, Nuxt and Nitro app with the only things that are included in, uh, in your actual app needed. Um, another thing that's maybe worth mentioning is that when you build your server, um, everything is... Uh, is dynamically imported. So each of your pages becomes a separate chunk, which can be fetched um, only when it's needed. Um, and everything in your um, server directory becomes a separate chunk that's only imported when it's needed. So let me just show you what that looks like. If in our um, Nitro configuration, we enable the timing uh, function, this is probably not something you do in production, but just to, to demo it, So we'll just build our app. Now, um, if we, you'll see that um, loading the basic server took 11 milliseconds in this case, uh, and it started listening. Uh, 
I then my browser because it was a dev server it, it was trying to refresh and immediately called the the um, uh, uh, index page uh, and it so it loaded the server uh, and which took another chunk to load that particular endpoint. If I then make another API request, so here I'll hit this RSX chunk, um, then actually I'll get some server timings. Um, and you can actually take a look at what each of the different chunks took to load, like the different bits of time that they took. Um, or you might even be able to see that in your network tools. Uh, let's see if I can open my network dev tools and have a look at the document. Um, you should be able to view the server timings there uh, and maybe even in the timing tab, you can have a look at some of the different timings and how long each, each one of them took. That's quite a handy tool to see. But basically it tells you that each of these different chunks is loaded separately. Uh, and actually they took a very short amount of time because it's a tiny app. But, uh, but you would be able to see that um, only the chunks that are needed to render the particular request are actually uh, being loaded at any point in time. Um, one of the things that uh, might be worth saying is that uh, a lot of the things that we do are designed to be uh, portable and usable on different providers or environments. So um, this app, I've just been building it for Node and running it, but I could also run, run it for um, do preset is bun, and I can build it for bun. Uh, and that will then, that is bun runtime. And I can preview the build using bun run output server next MJS. And that will actually use some bun specific APIs. You can see that that's uh, five millisecond cold start. Um, I could uh, build it for Cloudflare uh, pages, for example. Uh, and that's going to build it. It's going to be a very different format because uh, Cloudflare works very differently. And I have a, a different command I can use uh, to preview it uh, locally. Um, and I can run that command. It will install the Cloudflare um, develop uh, in, well, the Cloudflare Wrangler tool. Uh, and I'll be able to preview it in a Cloudflare-like environment. Um, the same is true. So this is, this is true for deployment targets. But it's not just true for deployment targets. So we have built-in doesn't look any different, but it's, it's now it's running on a Cloudflare environment. The same is true with quite a lot of other things. So I have access, for example, to the, uh, the Nitro storage API. Um, and we can actually define different bits of um, uh, key value storage um, to be accessible on different providers. So uh, in our server routes, we can do things like uh, access the uh, use storage uh, utility and then get uh, get items. Uh, and I could get and set items in a, in a universal key value kind of way. It's powered by unstorage, um, which again, another library that we, we spun out. Uh, and it has a huge number of different backends uh, from lots on Azure to capacitor preferences or Cloudflare um, file system, um, even REST API backed uh, key value storage and lots and lots of different things. Um, so unstorage supports a lot of different backends. Uh, and it means uh, typically what you would want to do um, is set your, your backend based on whether it's production or local, for example. So you might want to, um, to do that in your Nuxt configuration. Uh, in your Nuxt configuration, you can uh, specify different overrides for different environments. So we could say with a dollar sign production um, override, here we can set anything at all. Uh, any uh, of the same options that are available in our next config, but it will only apply when we're building for production. Uh, and you can do the same in development, and you can do the same in test mode. Um, so you can set these, these overrides, and that's a very handy way of specifying, say, that in production, you want to use the Cloudflare KV uh, binding, but in development, you're just going to use the, the memory driver that's, that is default. Um, so you can you can do that, and it, it doesn't matter for your code because the actual code when you're using the storage driver is provider agnostic. So a couple of good examples of what that might look like. Um, take a look at at Elk. Um, Elk Elk Zone is a client for Mastodon, um, and it has uh, support for a number of different uh, a number of different providers. So you can using runtime. Config set whether you want to use the file system, which is enabled by default in development, 
Cloudflare drivers if you're deploying somewhere that needs that. Uh, Vercel, uh, you can actually use the Vercel KV storage uh, or you can use memory driver. Um, that's just how this particular app is configured. And that is quite a useful way. Uh, you can basically just based on runtime config, set which driver is mounted. But this is the only provider specific stuff here. Everywhere else just directly is able to use the storage um, and access that as a cache API. You can also access Redis and you can write your own drivers as well. They're incredibly simple. We wrote, wrote a driver here in the Elk project. This is a driver for unstorage and you can write your own kind of, of uh, binding uh, if you need to. Um, so if you're using a storage or something like that, um, it should just work in a provider agnostic way. Um, I so much really I could have covered. I'm aware we're <laughs> sort of I'm trying people's patience, uh, but uh, we have similar kinds of pro provider agnostic uh, utilities for images, for example. You can try right. uh, Nuxt Image, um, which again supports lots and lots of different uh, different uh, providers. So you might have uh, anything from the uh, the built-in uh, IPX image optimizer, which optimizes it at runtime uh, for you, uh, or you might have a, a provider that, that creates and resizes images at runtime. And basically you can configure those in your next configuration and then just use it uh, seamlessly in your app. That's a, one of the best ways of getting better performance out of a web app is making sure your images are appropriately sized um, and uh, optimized for, for the environment. Um, so that's definitely worth, worth checking out as well. Uh, and in the coming days, um, there'll be quite a fun new announcement um, about uh, Nuxt fonts, which I can't wait to tell you a little bit more about as well. While you're taking a sip there, you know, I know a lot of the community web dev in specific, you know, has had a lot of focus on like, for example, Next.js and their app router or React server components. Other people I saw were talking about quick with the context of in the context of whether it can stream or not. What what does that paradigm look like in Nux as far as this idea of, of partial rendering or you know streaming content or any of those kind of concepts? So you can stream, uh, you can return a stream from a, um, a, an API route. Um, that's not quite the same thing as, but I thought it was just worth saying that. Um, so you can return a stream from an API route if you need to. So for example, that's often if you're accessing something like open API, which streams responses back to you, um, you don't want to wait until the whole response is there and you just get a chunk of text. You want it to come in as it goes. And so you can you can do that. You can return a stream. Um, but they'll actually have a, a nice little uh, Nuxt um, example. Let's see, what is it? GitHub um, uh, Vassell AI, I think. Um, and there's there's a nice little Nuxt example you can take a look at if you want to see how um, a lot of Nuxt examples I see, but there are two two Nuxt examples, and you can have a look at what returning a stream from a Nuxt API endpoint looks like. It's it's quite nice. It's quite simple. Um, if you want to um, explore some of the the uh, the same kind of things that um, that App Router is is exploring, it's it's trying to ask the question. Uh, what if we had sort of more of a distinction between these environments, the client and the server? So what if you had some code you only ever wanted to run on the server? Uh, and we do have a, a way of doing that in, in Nux, which is different and I, I hope is, is pretty intuitive. Um, it's currently experimental. So if you enable component islands like this, just component islands, true. Uh, and we restart our dev server again. Um, we can now create server components. Um, so a server component is just like a normal Nuxt component. So in this case, we'll copy the footer and we'll call this one um, footer.server. Actually, I'll just make it a server component. So just rename it the footer.server.view. It's a server component. Your usage will be exactly the same. So in this case, we have uh, the footer. Um, it still accepts the same props, still looks the same when you use it in your app. Um, but when you actually open Open your app. Uh huh. I say that. What's the matter with that? Maybe I deleted it and then renamed it. Let's try it again. 
yeah, that didn't exist the footer dot view. So it, it's it's now it's now rendering. Here's a footer only. It's not going to be hydrated, um. So it's going to be fully server rendered, um, and it's just going to be HTML that comes across there, uh, and that works at, also when you're navigating across apps, and it even works with uh, statically generated pages. So if we were to run something like bun uh, run build uh, pre render, um, it's going to create a static app without a server backend. Uh, and it is also going to be able to render uh, that um, the footer uh, server component as a JSON file there. Um, it's throwing an error because about isn't accessible. We built a, an app that, that had a page we couldn't access because of the middleware we created earlier that completely denied access to, to about. If I disable that, it will build fine. Um, but yes, that pre-render is building the entire, entire app for us, including the server component. Uh, and so that output looks a little bit like this. Um, it has just a string of HTML. Uh, and then also has some other things too, um, which are used to enable more advanced features of server components, like having interactivity within them, um, passing slots to them, or adding stuff um, like HTML or CSS to your page when you use them. It's even possible to host your server components on a different server from your app. Um, so you could have a server which is serving server components for your entire enterprise. And then you have a number of different Next apps, each of which use server components from that single server. Lots of cool things to explore there. Um, I would, yeah, lots of, lots of exciting stuff with server components. Absolutely. That was really interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that has kind of been blowing us away with the dev tools, it's just how many how many things it integrates into up and down the stack from the experience of looking at it to your source control to your config and everything up and down. One thing that strikes me as interesting is this idea of it doesn't, or at least we hadn't talked about like deployment. Um, usually we rely on on those platforms to build the hooks that connect with like our tooling in order to facilitate that. But does Nuxt have the similar re requirement or is there somehow some sort of like aid in the dev tools that helps you get it deployed on whatever hosting platform you want to host it on? Like, how do you guys take that stand? Is that, is that the responsibility of the host or, or is there some hooks in that, in, in what you guys have set up? So, um, well, there's no, there's no dev tools command and we are talking about a Nuxt deploy command. That would be quite a nice uh, thing to be able to do. But um, right now we, it's not up to the provider in that we integrate with the provider. So if you have a look at the Nitro configuration, for example, um, you can see some of the providers that we support and you can create your own presets for these diff for different providers as well. So if, if you have your own custom setup, that's totally fine. Uh, most of these providers are zero config. Uh, so if we can make it zero config, it's zero config. We detect that you're, so if, if for example, you connect the cell or Netlify or Amplify or something for Azure Static Web Apps, to your to your your app, it builds the app in that environment, and we can detect that it's being built in one of those environments. So we know, for example, hey, this is a Vercel server building us. So we're going to output the cell shaped build output. And Vercel just picks that up and deploys it um, with all the native features of Vercel that we have enabled. The same is true of Netlify. The same is true of AWS Amplify. The same is true of CloudFlare Pages. The same is true of uh, StormKit. Um, same is true, I think, Firebase as well. But uh, basically, we, ha we have a pretty good zero config support for people. Uh, and most of that is, so in, in a lot of these providers' cases, it's that we have created the, the output. In some cases, though, the, the providers themselves have worked with us to give us what we need. So something like an environment variable to tell us that we're running in that environment, or they have expanded um, their their output, like their, their deployment format, so that we can actually produce stuff in it. So um, Vercel has been great to work with. Amplify are amazing. They have done a really great job helping us to integrate with them. We also have a preset for a image that fits in. Um, Netlify, actually so many of these storm kit, like I, 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 I the, the people that I get to work with as part of this are just incredible. Um, but basically, we, we do the work, most of it, um, to make sure that your Nuxt app can, can run on these different um, environments and, and providers. And not just Nuxt. 
You can run a Nitro server on its own if you just need an API and you don't want Next. Uh, and obviously, frameworks like Analog and uh, Solid Start get all the benefits of this, just like Next does. It's all, all the same backend. Well, I'll say that the one word that sticks in my mind after all of this is just the word frictionless. I think it's been pretty remarkable the degree to which, uh, you know, I don't know if you were watching the questions off the side monitor or something like that, but uh, <laughs> you were answering all the questions and usually the answer is, here, let me show you this amazing documentation page that shows you how you can integrate 20 different options of the thing that you're trying to do. And uh, that's, you know, that's that's pretty remarkable. These docs are are phenomenal. I know, I know you all have worked really hard across the board on them. So, uh, you know, kudos to the team for that, for sure. Thank you so much. That's really lovely to hear. Is, as I give everybody one last chance here, if they have any last burning questions, um, for the people that are watching, can you let people know if there's any particular communities or places where Nux developers congregate or that you might congregate to talk about Nux uh, for people that would want to you know, connect with other people using this technology or would like to ask questions or things of that nature? So um, the first thing just to say is that um, if you want to, uh, I am very happy if anyone wants to book a call with me. So uh, if you're interested particularly in getting involved in open source or, uh, or there's something I can help with, um, let me know. I'd be really happy to talk to you no matter who, who you are or what your background is. Um, and you can access my website at row.dev uh, or get in contact in another way. I hang out on Twitter and on Mastodon quite a lot. On Twitter, I'm Daniel Zero. And on Mastodon, I'm Daniel at row.dev. The Nux community is very active um, on, on Twitter as well. You can follow Nux underscore JS. Um, you can also join our Discord server, which is discord.nuxjs.org. Um, that there are lots and lots of questions. I check it every day. I read most messages. Uh, and there are lots of other moderators and people um, who will be available to, to chat and answer questions. So that's really, really good too. Uh, if you have issues, then GitHub is a great place to go. So feel free to create an issue. And again, I'll check, I'll check it. Um, and uh, and that would be that's a very, very helpful space to get. Uh, particularly if you have a reproduction, um, we can either fix it if it's a bug or probably we could spot what the issue might be if there's something else that you're encountering. Um, I think those are the places I would go primarily. But, um, but yes, anywhere that works for you. Stack Overflow is also available. That's really cool. You know, and maybe that's the the last stage of development for the Nux Dev Tools or something. Uh, you know, I was talking to some uh, app providers recently that are you know working in the space of capturing all those variables in the browser to make uh, recreation steps and, and stack traces and things much easier to capture. And I, I swear, well, if you're about to open up some tab of the Dev Tools and show this to me, you're about to blow my mind for real. <laughs> no, that would be. That'd be extremely cool. Uh, you think about replay? That's, uh, that's yeah, stuff cool, like that. Cool, yeah, cool concept. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, this is this has been phenomenal. So, uh, Daniel, thank you so much uh, for everybody that uh, took the time to watch this. Thank you so much. If you have other ideas um, in you know things that you'd like to hear about Vue, about Nux, or about anything else, please make sure to comment. And you know, again, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, or see if we can you know do follow ups in the future on any other topics that we may not have been able to cover in enough depth today. Uh, but yeah, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day, and uh, thank you, Daniel. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Before we get back to our conversation, we wanted to say thank you to This Labs, who is the sponsor of today's show. If you need help with a project that has failed to deliver on time or are in need of a team that feels true ownership over your engineering projects, definitely hit up this.labs. They specialize in helping business leaders ensure their strategic digital initiatives stay on track. Trusted by companies like PlayStation, Capital One, Herman Miller, PayPal, and T-Mobile, you can find them at this.co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Now, let's return to our show.